It is a great honor to be with you this evening, and our passage is Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Now, having covered this passage uh, at St. Andrews a number of years ago, uh, I spent, I think, about four or five weeks preaching through this one passage, and so this evening we'll be looking at it uh, a bit more quickly and uh, as we make our way through it to try to grasp some of the most significant aspects of what Paul is teaching us in Romans 12 verses 1 and 2. I'll read it now. This is the Word of God. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, and we thank you, O Lord, for your love for us. Lord, we ask that our time together uh, tonight and tomorrow would be a time wherein we are more deeply grounded in your word, your truth, and your doctrine. And we pray, Father, that as we are more deeply grounded in it, that you might help us more to love you with all our being, that you'd help us as your disciples to love one another, and that the world would see our love for one another and know that we are your disciples. That you would help us, O Lord, to love our neighbor as ourselves, which sometimes seems very difficult, sometimes even impossible to do. But Lord, we ask that you would help us to come away not just with greater minds filled with greater and deeper knowledge of your word, but also, Lord, with bigger hearts for one another, for Jesus Christ, our Savior. And Lord, that you would be honored in all of this, and it is all for your glory, we pray. Amen. Paul appeals to the Romans. This urging, this exhortation is authoritative. Paul, writing under the superintending power of the Holy Spirit, is appealing to them or exhorting them or urging them with authority, divine authority. Now, we all understand what it is to appeal, to urge one another, to make an exhortation to one another. Those of us who are elders, pastors in the room, we certainly understand what it is to exhort and to urge and to appeal. But we understand that our appealing and our urging is not in and of itself authoritative, that our authority is not inherent that the authority that we possess as pastors, as elders, is not authority that is rooted or grounded within us. Our authority is ministerial authority. That is to say, our authority is servant authority. It is declarative authority to declare and to appeal and to urge and to exhort that which God in His Word appeals to, exhorts, and urges His people. It's very important that we as pastors put ourselves and keep ourselves in our appropriate place. We are not to get too big for our britches and to make our people think that we are their ultimate authority. God and God's Word alone is their ultimate infallible authority for faith and life. Our job is to declare it to them. Too many pastors in our day, in every denomination, too many pastors have lifted themselves up as if they are some sort of inherent, autonomous authority in the lives of the people whom they serve. And let us be reminded that the flock is not our flock ultimately, it is God's flock. Paul appeals to the Romans with the divine authority as one writing Scripture. He says, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, or the compassions of God. Now, it's interesting that he uses this language, which is very fond or very frequent of the Apostle Paul. He's very fond of this language by the mercies of God. And again, that word can easily be translated the compassions of God. Well, it needs to be asked, why would Paul say it like that? Why would Paul use that language, the mercies of God? Why not just the mercy of God? Or why not just the grace of God or the compassion of God? Well, in many ways, it's because of what Paul's been doing throughout the entirety of this epistle. He has been laying out in a systematic way, and let us not forget that throughout his systematic theology of the first 11 chapters, Paul is also filling those chapters with a tremendous amount of application of that theology. 
It's not as if Paul goes from a systematic theological explanation in chapters 1 through 11 to immediately a hard break now going to the ethical application and the practical ramifications of that theology. Now, that is generally the case, but he does that application of the theology throughout the chapters. But really what he's been giving to us are the compassions, the multitude compassions and mercies of God. Really, that's what Romans is all about. If you were to sum it up in one sentence, what is Romans about? It is about the mercies of God. It is about the compassion of God. It is about the grace of God in its manifold manifestation. That's not just what Romans is about. It's what the gospel is about. It's what the Bible is about. The Bible is about God's compassions, His mercies, and how God is selective sovereignly in how He demonstrates and displays and shows His mercy. All of this is by the mercies of God, the compassions of God that Paul appeals to them. This is our basis. God's mercies, God's compassions in our lives, it is the basis for everything that we are and everything that we do. Many of you and People ask you about your life, ask you about how you've been blessed, ask you even how you're doing. Most of us cannot help but remind others that our entire lives are based on the compassion of God. Our entire existence, our very being, whatever we have, whatever happinesses or joys that we've ever experienced, even the pains and the trials and the miseries that He has had us to endure in His sovereignty, we all know is because of His compassion and His mercy, leading us to repentance, leading us to have greater contentment in Him, leading us to be more and more tired of the sin in our minds and bodies and the sins that surround us in this world and more and more desirous of our eternal home. It is all on the basis of God's compassions, His mercies, that we can do anything, that Paul even pleads with us to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, in reading this passage, and many of you have been reading it for many decades and studying it, has it ever, has it ever crossed your mind and have you ever asked the question, why is it that Paul says, present your bodies? Why is it that he says bodies? Why doesn't Paul say, present your being or present your hearts. I mean, isn't the way we often speak, isn't that the way we often hear Christians speak, especially when it comes to evangelism or when it comes to what we're sharing? Sometimes we will speak to people in our evangelism efforts and say, you need to give your heart to Jesus. We talk about sharing our hearts and having a burden on our hearts. We as Christians are spiritual people, spiritual beings, and so rightly we speak about the heart. But why is it that Paul didn't say heart? Why is it he didn't say whole being? Why is it that he said bodies? Well, scholars suggest that it's very likely that the reason he said bodies was intentionally to grab the attentions of the Romans. Because the Romans, especially those who had studied philosophy, knew well that it had always been believed that the material the physical is bad, and that the spiritual is good. And so, it was very likely that Paul, knowing that, was trying to grab their attentions and even to be a little bit offensive in being blunt so that he, they understood that what Paul meant was not just their spiritual being, not just the good spiritual part of their being, but rather their bodies as well. He wanted to make it clear to them that it was to be not just their mindset, not just their perspective, not just their sense or perception, but it was to be their bodies. That which many deemed just evil or physical or bad, that God in His work redeemed the whole person, including the body. So again, likely to grab the attentions of the Romans, but also perhaps to grab the attentions of all of those Jews who were in Rome and coming back to Rome, who also needed to hear that God in His salvation not only saves the heart, He not only saves the mind, He saves our entire being. Now, we all understand this, don't we? But how often do we, or Christians that we know, how often do we live as if God gets our spiritual part, that our spiritual 
part of our lives belongs to God, but that our physical part sort of belongs to ourselves. We meet people all the time in our communities who say that they are what? Spiritual people. I'm a spiritual person, they say. I'm a man of faith. And what that typically means is they have faith in the God of their own making. Typically, people who refer to themselves as spiritual people or people of faith have often the occasion to refer to God as my God or your God. And anytime someone starts speaking in those terms as to my God or your God, run. Because my God and your God is usually never the God. But the God of Scripture saves the entire being. And we are called to be Christians whose entire being, all of that we are, belong to God. Our bodies, our minds, our hearts, every aspect of our being belongs to the Lord. This is why Paul in Ephesians 5, when he speaks to husbands and wives, and he says to husbands, you are to love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that we are to do likewise. That is to say, we are to live for our wives with our whole being. We are to give ourselves to our wives. We are to live in a way that all of our lives, all of our interests, all of our perspectives exist to strive to serve them in giving ourselves to them. We note that in Ephesians 5, Paul doesn't simply say Christ died for the church, but rather he gave himself for the church. Because Christ didn't simply come and die, what did he do? He came and he lived. He lived the perfect life, the sinless life, so that when he died, his death would be a perfect substitutionary atonement, vicarious for us. Husbands, you're not called simply to die for your wife. That would be relatively easy. And most of us will never have the opportunity to actually die for our wives. The point in Ephesians 5 is that we are called not just to die for them or to be willing to die for them, but to live for them. And that means it must be a life of self-sacrifice. That must mean it needs to be a life of self-denial. You see, we all have really the same love language. And the love language that all good marriages exist by is the love language of self-denial. That we are called to live our lives in such a way that we're living self-sacrificially, self-denying, giving our entire being, not just part of our being, not just part of our time, but the whole of our being to our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for the church, ultimately dying for his people. Paul says that in presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, we are doing so because it is holy and acceptable to God. It is holy and acceptable to God. It is acceptable to Him for us to present our bodies, and this is Old Testament language, language at the sacrifice where animals were to be brought holy and acceptable and living. They were to be brought not already dead, of course. They would be killed and slaughtered and sacrificed there. But you can imagine what that would have looked like in the Old Testament sacrificial system. Coming to the tabernacle and then the temple, the house of meeting, as they would bring these large animals. Imagine all the sounds they were making. Imagine, imagine the blood. Imagine the smells that came from that place of sacrifice. Imagine what was on the ground. But these sacrifices were to be holy and acceptable to God, and they were to be living. God demanded these sacrifices. Now we are the temple of God. Christ is our priest, and we are the ones now coming to offer ourselves daily. Many of us live our lives sort of playing games with God. We think that if we make one sacrifice for Him, He now owes us. We do a little something for Him, and we think, okay, God, I did that little thing for you last week. Remember how how good I was last week. Remember that thing I did, that generosity, that self-sacrifice, the way I took care of that? Remember how patient I was with my wife last week? And we play these little games with God and we think, okay, God, I did that good thing for you. I did that good deed for you last week. Now it's your time to repay me. 
You see, we all have a little bit of a health, wealth, prosperity preacher lurking in our hearts. We all think that if we can make deals with God, if we can, if we can do little good things, then He really owes us. We can all fall into that devilish trap. But the Lord calls us to bring ourselves daily. And coming on a daily basis with what is against our nature and our inherent mindset, our inherent way of thinking, we are not by nature self-sacrificial people, especially us men. We are by nature self-centered. Just ask your wives. We are not naturally self-sacrificial, and so coming on a daily basis, coming and being living sacrifices, living in this way on a daily basis is tiring for us sinners because it grinds against who we naturally are. But this is how we are called to live our lives the daily living sacrifice, coming to God, presenting ourselves to Him, being ready to serve, being ready to suffer, being ready to do whatever it is God has called us to do, even when it means doing one of the hardest things for many of us to do, and that is to say, please forgive me. I'm sorry. I was wrong. I repent of my sin. In coming as living sacrifices, it means we are coming ready to be humbled and humiliated ready to come and serve. As living sacrifices, our entire beings are presented to God. This is what is right. This is what is acceptable. This is what is set apart and consecrated and holy. And why are we doing it? And to whom are we doing it? To God. Why why are we here anyway? I mean, why do we exist as human beings? We exist because God wanted us. He didn't need us. He desired us. Isn't that an amazing thought? Especially for those of us who are here this evening, worried, doubting, maybe even skeptical, questioning God's goodness, questioning His grace, questioning His sovereignty, worried about tomorrow, worried about finances, worried about job, worried about retirement, worried about the loss of a loved one, worried about cancer and the disease that you or your loved one has. We worry, but why are we here? It's because God wanted you. He didn't need us, He wanted us. And so He decided to choose a people for Himself in Christ before the foundation of the world because we were the primary thought. The earth and what God made was secondary. The earth was created for us to inhabit so that God might have a people for Himself to love and to show His affection to and to pour out His compassions upon. We exist for God. God made us and gave us breath so that we might be His people now and forever. That's why we're here. That's why human beings exist. That's why we're made in His image, and that's why God in His initial plan chose a people for Himself in Christ. And so it is only appropriate, it is only fitting that we would be a people who now present ourselves to Him, who come before Him, not not under duress, not because we are forced to do so, but rather because God has changed our hearts. Because God has given us hearts that fear Him, God has given us hearts that love Him, God has given us now hearts that want to please Him. It is interesting though, isn't it? That sometimes in our lives, sometimes we go through seasons. When our hearts seem far from God. Sometimes we go through seasons in our lives where our affections are not as focused on our Lord as they once were. There are times when we fall into temptations and we fall into sin. You can't seem to break out of it. Times we fall into mild or even severe sadness. Even some have experienced depression. You can't seem to shake it. Sometimes we seem distant from God or we think that He is distant from us, which He is never. But we feel 
differently and we feel sad and we feel far apart and we feel lonely. And it is oftentimes during those times when the Lord, even through the trial of sadness itself or through a greater trial, that He teaches us again and again how much we truly need Him, why we really are here. Sometimes He has to take away from us so that we cling to that which will never be taken away, namely Himself. Sometimes the Lord puts us through trials so that we will remember that the reason He saved us was to make us His living vessels who, whose entire being is made for the purpose of giving ourselves to Him as a living sacrifice. This is, Paul writes, our spiritual worship. Now that is in truth one of the poorest translations of any of the translations that I've come across. Some of you can recall the old King James Version, which you memorized, Romans 12, 1 and 2. You remember what it was? This is not your spiritual worship, but this is your reasonable service. Remember that? Now, that gets more at the heart of what is going on here. Now, let's take a minute here and talk about this phrase and the word that Paul is using here because it really is a very important word that we understand. It is only used by Paul here in all of his writings, and it's used by Peter in 1 Peter 2. And the word is fascinating. It goes all the way back to Aristotle, then to Athenagoras and to Tatian, but we find it interestingly used by Epictetus in one of his uh, discourses where he says something like this, if I were a nightingale, I would do the work of a nightingale. If I were a swan, that of a swan. But as it is, I am, and he uses this word, and the word is logicus. As it is, I am a logicus being, and therefore I shall sing praise to God. Now, the word logicus, what does it mean? You can go to the best commentaries and you can strive to understand how this word was used in ancient Greek literature and maybe how Paul meant it, maybe how Peter meant it in his epistle. But it's a fascinating word that has a rich, rich history. We have the words of, that are cognates in English, of course, to logicus. We have logician, logic. We understand what those things mean. And they are not exactly the same, but we sometimes use the word logical in a similar sense to likely the way Paul is using it here in Romans 12. The word, again, the King James better gets at the meaning of the word when it uses the word or translates it reasonable. But translating it spiritual doesn't really get at the heart of what this word is. Because the word is getting at not only the inner attitudes and the inner motives of who we are, but, but getting at the heart of why we do what we do and even the manner in which the how of what we do. It's getting at the appropriateness and thus the authenticity of who we are our hearts, and why we do what we do. Go back to Epictetus's poem. If I were a nightingale, I would do what a nightingale does, a swan, I would do what a swan does, but as it is, I am a logicus being, and therefore I will praise God. I am a being that was made for a particular purpose. I am a logicus being made in the image of God, made for a particular purpose, and thus it is appropriate, it is fitting, it is the only authentic, genuine thing that we can do, and that is to praise God. What Paul is likely getting at here is that this service of ours is the most appropriate and fitting and authentic and genuine thing that we as human beings created in the image of God can do. You see, our service are presenting our bodies to our Lord in a holy, acceptable, and living manner. This is what we were made to do. This is what we were made fit to do by the Spirit of God at work in our hearts. This is why God saved us through Christ, so that God might have you 
as the sweet smelling aroma of the sacrifice of giving yourself to him. Isn't, isn't this something that we understand in our daily lives and our relationships? Isn't this what we want from those around us? In a perfect world, each one of us would be coming to one another and say, I'm here for you. Don't you love it when a friend or a loved one says, I'm here for you? Don't you love when you're sick or you're hurting and a community of friends comes around you and says, I'm here for you, what do you need? As the church, we understand what it is to care for one another, to come to one another and say, what can I do for you? How can I serve you? What can we do? What can we make? How can we help? We'll give our time. We'll give our energies. What food do you need? How can we help you? Because we understand that whether it's in a marriage, in the church, in the family, that really what we want is we want people around us who convey to us that they genuinely love us. That's all we want. We don't need to have wealth. We don't need to have everything in the world. All we want are people around us who love us and are willing to give themselves to us and say, I'm here for you. I care for you and I love you. And I will listen as long as you need me to listen. I will sit here as long as you need me to sit here. I will do for you whatever it is you need me to do for you. This is why the marriage is compared to this sort of relationship. And this is why our marriage to our groom, Jesus Christ, is also compared to this because it is a perfect marriage. It is a perfect marriage wherein Christ Jesus will one day wipe every tear from our eyes and will never leave us again. But we will be with him forever in the heavenly places. In presenting our bodies as living sacrifices, this is our fitting, our authentic, and our genuine worship, our service to the Lord. And so Paul exhorts, do not be conformed to this world. Now that language we certainly understand. It's the language that we use when we're conforming something. Uh, to conform something means to uh, be pressured into or squeezed into a mold. Again, to be pressured or squeezed into a mold. It's interesting that Paul uses that word, isn't it? Because it's as if he's suggesting that the world has the power to do that to us. Now, notice that throughout Paul's letters, he is constantly warning the church to beware and to be warned and to be on the lookout for those who would be conforming them those who secretly creep in, those who with their big talk and their smooth talk and flattery, it means they're very cunning. That means often they're great communicators. That means often they say all the right things that we want to hear because it tickles our ears in just the right way. That often means they have big followings, sometimes they have big ministries, sometimes they're really good looking, sometimes they have really big teeth and really big smiles. <laughs> But they have a following and they have a way to con people with their flattery and their smooth talk and their nice words. Why is it that he's constantly warning us? Because, dearly beloved, where error and where false teaching usually has its greatest and quickest rise is from within that which is the most or has been the most trusted, namely the church. This is why heresies, false teaching, and liberalism of one sort or another typically first rises in the church. If you study history, what you will see is that liberal mindset, progressive mindset, whatever you want to call it, false teaching of different sorts, both doctrinally, socio-politically, socio-culturally, it often begins in the church. And it is the world's mindset and the world's ideology, the world's way of thinking that has crept into the mind of the preacher, crept into the mind of the pastor. And usually the seeds were sown in seminary. Seminary is usually the, the sort of the, the birthing place, and the, it has its sort of heyday in the church eventually. And these ideal, ideologies and perspectives are usually planted early on, and they blossom later on, and usually in places that were once very trusted. The language of conforming, the language of 
pressuring into a mold is the language of what the world is trying to do. They are trying to infiltrate. They are trying to constantly get us to think the way they think, to grasp and have and share their mindset. And if you've noticed, at least in recent years, it's not like it was years ago, at least here in the States, where they wanted us to agree with this or agree with that. Have you noticed? The world now wants us to adopt their entire religion. They have put every aspect of their principled religion together in one package, and they've said to us, if you don't accept it all, we will have nothing to do with you. We will completely cut you off. If you don't adopt our ideologies and perspectives on everything, we won't even dialogue with you. This is happening with children and parents all around our country. They will not talk with their parents. They will not even have dialogue with them because if a parent is not willing to adopt the entirety of their mindset, the entirety of their newfound religion, then they cut us off. Have you noticed how cult-like the culture is today? And they have cut us off. But what is the one tactic they are using to pressure us? And make no mistake about it, it's peer pressure. It's peer pressure to make us conform, to fit us into their mold. Do you know what the one, the one major tactic they've been using? They've been using it over in the UK for many years. They've been using it in Europe for decades. But what is it? It's one word. Love. They want to convince us that our being biblically dogmatic and standing firm and steadfast and unwavering on the unchanging and authoritative Word of God, that we who do not shift, that we who do not move, that we who stay true to the principles, the ethics, and the teachings of the unchanging Word of God, that we are unloving, that we are dogmatic, that we are judgmental. That we who look to the Word of God as the unchanging, unvarnished, authoritative constitution of our entire life and way of thinking, that we who do not move and that we do not go with the culture, that we are unloving. They want to say that what we believe is hate speech when in fact what we truly believe and what we truly confess and what we adhere to is nothing but love speech. Because it is out of love, out of love for God, out of love for our neighbor, because love must speak the truth, because it's grounded in the truth. And the world wants to conform us to its way of thinking, its mindset, and the pressure that it uses is through the garb of love. It always has. And this is why so many Christians are so susceptible to moving in that direction, because it sounds good. And it sounds like true love when, in fact, it's a lie. Do not be conformed to this world. Young people who are here, the world is going to try to conform you in every which way it possibly can. You must withstand it in love and in grace and in kindness, but you must withstand it nevertheless. Because once they bring you in, and once they begin to conform you to their mold, they've got you. And you'll notice that you'll begin to deny this doctrine. You'll begin to deny the exclusivity of Christ. You'll begin to deny some of the most basic and cardinal tenets of our faith. You'll leave the church. You'll leave behind what many would call traditional Christianity, which is really just another name for biblical Christianity. And they do it by conforming you with their contorted and twisted definitions of the words that God gave to us. Do not be conformed to the world, Paul writes, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. It's interesting that Paul uses these words together because the word transform is very much the same thing as the word renewal. And did you know that this word renewal is a word that we don't really find elsewhere in ancient Greek literature? In fact, some scholars say that Paul probably coined this word, and it makes sense, doesn't it? Because why else would any ancient Greek 
writer or philosopher ever have the need to come up with a word that describes a new mind. They would have no concept of what it was to have a completely renovated mind because they believed it was just a matter of education, just a matter of training, just a matter of learning. Paul brings a new word for the right purpose that there would be no need for such a word before their understanding of the Spirit's work in our hearts in giving us new hearts and new minds. That the new mind, this renewed or renovated mind, is a completely transformed mind, and it has already been definitively renewed, definitively, once for all, renewed or renovated by Christ, by the Spirit, and now as it is, we are now to strive and to continue in that work that the Spirit is doing in us as we strive to constantly be renewed by the Word of God. This is what the Bible teaches. You know the gospel, now walk worthy of the gospel. You have the Spirit, now walk in the Spirit. Your mind is renovated and renewed. Now strive and live each and every day, not being conformed by the world, but constantly being renewed in your mind. The renewal of your mind, elsewhere Paul uses it in Titus chapter 3, but here is probably the first time in all of literature where the word is used that our minds would be renovated. I think sometimes, I think sometimes some Christians I think we sometimes give God parts of our minds. We say, Lord, I'll give you an, enough of my mind as you need to have, but I'm gonna fill the rest of it of, of, with junk. I think we sometimes treat the Lord with our minds and with our hearts and with our being as if we're giving God a portion God, here's your 10% of my mind. I get the rest. God, I, I, I read the Bible this week, or I read the Bible today. Now the rest of my day is mine. It is the complete and entire renovation and renewal of the whole being, the heart, the mind, the body. And Paul tells us that there is a practical purpose in all this. There's an end in this. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God. That's interesting, isn't it? Because we hear Paul say elsewhere in Ephesians 5, verse 10, where he says, discern what is pleasing to the Lord. The ESV translates it, uh, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. But really, in the original, it's just very simple. Discern what is pleasing to the Lord. It's very much the same thing he's saying here because the language of discerning has to do with approving because when we discern something, we are making a decision, aren't we? Making a right judgment. We are trying to make a decision as to what is right and what is wrong or what is right and almost wrong, what is right and false and what is right and kind of false. And we are called to live our lives with this discernment. We are called to be discerning people. People don't have the gift of discernment or the lack of that gift. As Christians, we have the Spirit of God, and we are enabled thus to make discerning decisions in all of life. We test and we prove, we determine. And how do we do that? Well, we do it first and foremost by the Spirit of God and looking to the Word of God. And don't forget that without the Spirit of God, we would not be able to rightly discern the spiritual things of God in His Word. But there are things in Scripture that are not always addressed. And that's why we need older fathers and mothers. That's why we need a company of friends and brothers and sisters that we can go to. That's why we need to go to experienced men and women in our churches and learn from them and listen to them. And young men and women, that means we need to close our mouths and just listen. Follow their patterns, follow their examples of life, watch their peace, watch their patience, watch their love for God and for one another. And when we see those traits and those characteristics exemplified, those are the men and the women we should go to. Not simply the men or women who know their doctrine well, but are constantly divisive and gossiping. But rather go to those men and women who know their doctrine and know the Bible and love the God of the Bible. 
You hear them talk not only about doctrine, but you hear them talk about their love for Jesus. You not only hear them talk about their doctrine, but you hear and see and watch and observe in their lives true and genuine, not acted, but true humility. Together, as we look to his word, as we discern together and approve that which is right, as we lean upon our forefathers from the ages, we discern and approve what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Because the truth of the matter is, dearly beloved, the only way really that, the only way that we can really have our minds renewed is if we first recognize they need to be. And there are many Christians who often walk in pride. They think they've arrived. You ever met a Christian like that? They think they've arrived either ecclesiastically or doctrinally. It seems like they have nothing ever to learn from anybody. They, they have all the answers, and no one can tell them anything. You don't see these people typically as servants because they've risen above that. You ever notice? There are certain Christians who have graduated from service. They did that when they were younger, but now they've graduated. They're beyond that. We first must need to understand on a daily basis that we need our minds renewed, renovated. We need our minds cleansed. If we were to admit to one another tonight what goes on in our minds, what things some enter our minds, we don't even understand how they get there at times. And so, the first step in having our minds renewed on a continual basis, recognizing on a continual daily basis how the noetic effects of the fall on our minds, our intellects, our entire being, how much we need the help of God to renew and cleanse our minds. And the only reason we're going to ever do that or come to that place on a daily basis is if we have the mind of Christ. What is the mind of Christ? Paul writes in Philippians 2, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Friends, what we all need is the mind of Christ. And what Paul tells us is that fundamentally the, having the mind of Christ is having the mindset, having the heart, having our entire beings wrapped in humility. And those of us who understand the sovereignty of God and the grace of God in all of life, who understand rightly the compassions and the mercies of God and how much mercy each and every one of us has been shown, that we not only don't get what we deserve, we deserve not only not to be here, we deserve His eternal wrath and damnation and condemnation forever. And we who understand that sovereignty, we who understand the character of God as He's revealed Himself in His Word ought to be the most humble people that the world knows, not the most arrogant, not the most pompous. We ought to be a people who are humble because our Savior was humble, and to have the mind of Christ means to be a people whose minds are regularly renovated, regularly renewed by the Spirit of God at work within us because we are so aware of how miserable we are in and of ourselves. That is why those of us who are among the so-called Reformed, those of us who adhere to the theology of Scripture, ought to be the most humble people in the world. And the only way we can be there is by the work of the Spirit and the constant work of God's Word in our lives, convicting us and comforting us as He directs our eyes 
and our gaze to Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, and we thank you, Lord, that you have given, all, given us all the ability to recognize that we are miserable wretches without you. Lord, help us never to move on from your amazing grace, which has taught our hearts to fear and that same grace that leads us home. For it's in Christ's name and His glory we pray. Amen.